The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everybody, welcome to Ian Oshkosh. I'm very pleased to be joined this evening by uh, some gentlemen who have been here once in the past. Actually, one of them is here almost every week uh, that we tape because he is on our crew. Uh, to my right is Steve Blake. He is the president of, I want to get this right, Wisconsin Fathers for Children and Families. Um, and uh, to my left is uh, James Went. He is the director of Wisconsin Fathers. And our, our own crew member, Ken Walker, who's stepping out from behind the scenes tonight to come in front of the cameras and talk about a uh, little bit about his role um, as vice president of uh, special projects and you know his involvement in Wisconsin Fathers as well so thanks to all of you for being here Welcome. we appreciate it um, you know you guys have been on in the past uh, Ken and, and Steve um, but for people who may have missed that show let's just give a real brief overview whoever wants to take this of what the organization is and, and what you do certainly the um, uh, WFCF uh, started in 1988 and what we we're trying to do is in help children have both of their parents involved in their lives as much as possible. Um, we support, you know, the, the idea is supporting the entire family, um, especially the children who often get stuck in the middle between the battle between a mom and a dad when they're separated or never married, whatever it might be. Um, we offer both uh, emotional support or we have a, we have a hotline. Um, it's the 608 All Dads line. Um, and it's manned by, entirely by volunteers that helps fathers that are, and this is exactly how I discovered the group. Um, I'd been through a, a very difficult time trying to see my children in a very difficult okay. divorce. And um, it was by calling that number that I was connected to other people that could support me through this and, um, and allow me to come out as well as possible. And we hope to repeat that with as many people as possible. And um, okay. I said I've been around for 20 years and, uh, and we've been making some progress. It's been slow. Uh, but tireless efforts of uh, many, many people, such as Steve, um, has uh, I think we're making some some headway. Sure, and you know, and just to be clear, it's it's not about both mother and father being involved. If if one of them is not uh, a suitable parent material, I guess that's the best way to say it. It's absolutely it two two good quality parents, mm -hmm. and and uh, um, and that's and that's the sad part, which is, you know, so many times. There are two very good parents and two loving, caring parents, um, but due to the conflict and the divorce, or uh, using children as somehow to manipulate as a you know as a tool, um, we're, I'm not talking about you know bad dads, bad moms, just trying to, to game the system at all. I'm talking about the good parents who want to see their children but aren't able to, mm -hmm. and those are the people we're trying to help. And and what are the reasons why uh, a, a good dad? might not be able to see their their children with the court system as it's set up right now well good dads get to see their children under most circumstances but they only get to see their children a small percentage of the time what we propose and what we support is roughly equal parenting time mm -hmm. because children need to have both a mother and a father actively involved in their lives and under the current situation, not the law, the law is basically gender neutral, but the reality in family court is that mom gets to be the primary parent and dad gets to be a weekend dad, or mm -hmm. what we call a McDad. Um, he gets every other weekend and four hours on Wednesday, which works out to 28 hours a week, and you really can't be an effective parent and only 28 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So what we, what we support and what we push for is roughly equal parenting time. Okay, all right. And of course, um, 
guardian ad litems come into this. Uh, children are usually represented in divorces by, um, you know, their own attorney. Um, do you see that as a good thing, a bad thing, or I guess does it depend on the situation? Well, it's our philosophy that unless a parent has been proven to be unfit, then the state really doesn't have the authority to um, delve into all the private family affairs. Well, what kind of shoes do you buy the kids, and when, when do you take them to church, and how often do you go to PTA meetings? Mm -hmm. um, in an in a intact marriage, a couple that's together, this is not in the state's purview. Okay, so unless, like I said, unless there's there's clear and convincing evidence that one parent or the other is an unfit parent, then the starting point should be equal placement. And it needs, there needs to be, like I say, clear and convincing evidence that one parent or the other is not capable of being a parent. And this doesn't mean that, that uh, we mandate equal time. Mm -hmm. If one parent or the other doesn't want, then, you know, that, that gets worked out in the parenting agreement before, before it even goes into the court. But what we, what we want is to start out with equality. That's all we're asking for. Mm -hmm. We're not a, a, a pro-father, anti-mother group. Um, our philosophy is the best parent is both parents, and that children need to have both their mothers and their fathers equally and actively involved in their lives. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you are not a militant men's organization. You've actually got women who are members oh, yes, of absolutely. Wisconsin Fathers. Oh, right. That's right. So. That's right. Um, yeah, mo most of them are either the second wives, girlfriends, grandmothers, who are shut out of their grandchildren's or um, their life, and then that's they're the ones that are more uh, pushy to get involved. Mm -hmm. You know. Good. Um, well, you know, it's it, just a little editorial comment on my own here. It's, it's interesting that when there's a divorce going on or when domestic violence somehow factors into um, a breakup of a family, all of a sudden we've got all these competing interests and all these attorneys are involved, and yet if something does not get into the court system, nobody cares, it seems, Yes. What goes on in the household? <laughs> and there can be far more tragic things happening in, in our homes than what you're experiencing in a typical kind of divorce, mm -hmm. even if there's domestic abuse involved, you know? So I can actually share a, a guardian ad litem snippet story sure, sure. Um, that would tie into the domestic violence thing. Well, first of all, you know, in my case, the guardian asked me a very critical question, which was, uh, Mr. Wendt, what shoe sizes do your daughters wear? And I'm thinking, I don't know, last time I took them roller skating, I think it was a two and a three, and I'm going, how does that have to do with anything? But um, the question did come up about domestic violence. I said, yes, I've been hit a couple of times. Um, and it wasn't until afterwards that, that his response to this really struck me. But he looked right at me and he goes, what did you do to make her hit you? And I'm thinking, I don't know, I didn't really. But then after I walked out of the, his office, and probably about 15 minutes later, I was driving home thinking, wait a second, how, you know, would he have asked a woman that? I mean. Mm. If someone, if, if, if the reverse were true and if, if my now ex-wife were to say, yes, you know, my husband struck me, um, I don't think he would have looked at her and said, what did he do or what did you do to make him hit you? Um, and I thought that was very, that, that, that to me that started this whole thought process of there's a very different set of, a uh, different ruler used mm -hmm. to measure this and yeah. it's just never okay. There's usually a double set of standards no matter what. Right what we're dealing with in life. But you've kind of opened the door here, Jim, for um, something. There was, um, this, this happened uh, last month, I believe, uh, in, in Madison. There was a, a fundraiser for an anti-domestic violence organization being held in Madison. And um, some demonstrators, a small group of demonstrators from Wisconsin Fathers for Children and Families, um, was there protesting um, because the event's keynote speaker um, you guys said, has unfairly demonized men as the sole perpetrators of violence in the home. And, you know, this would be a good time, I think, to maybe, uh, we've got just a very short clip of um, a portion of that uh, protest, if you want to call it that. I'm being told uh, they've got some technical difficulties. So, <laughs> so if we can go to that at some point, you guys can let me know um, in the control room. Uh, but why don't we talk a little bit about the protest and you know, what it was that you felt that the keynote speaker was saying or doing that was wrong. Okay, well the first thing 
Um, I want to make it clear. Okay, you, you referred to the to the group, and it's the Domestic Abuse Intervention Services of Madison, Wisconsin. That's their official anti, name? It's an anti-domestic okay. violence group. Okay. okay. I want to make it clear. No one is pro-domestic right, violence. That's right. Right. Okay. Right. We are anti-domestic violence mm -hmm. as well. Our problems with, uh, with Mr. Bancroft, and I read his book, um, which is titled, Why Does He Do That? Mm -hmm. Our problems with his... Um, contention is that men are always the perpetrators and women are always the victims and this has um, been disproven by reams of, of studies um, in the last 10-20 years. Mm -hmm. Those studies show that the perpetrators and the initiators of domestic violence are roughly equal between men and women. As a matter of fact, there's a, a researcher at California State University by the name of Martin Fiebert who has published a bibliography of 249 um, peer-reviewed studies that indicate that men and women initiate violence against their partners in roughly equal numbers. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem that we have with Mr. Bancroft. Um, he claims that women never initiate domestic violence and if they are violent at all it's because they're defending themselves and this is simply not true mm -hmm. but this is what's our, our almost entire system of dealing with domestic violence is based on this comes from a study or a, a method called the um, the Duluth model okay and that was Roughly 20, 25 years ago, they interviewed some women who were in a battered women's shelter in Duluth, Minnesota. And they have based this whole um, structure based on that. Um, the power and control wheel, which some of your viewers may be familiar with, mm -hmm. um, shows that domestic violence stems from the patriarchal system and men, um, men's need to dominate. Um, and that's not true either. There is studies that show from the United States Center for Disease Control that um, almost 24% of relationships have some violence and half of those, roughly half, 49%, um, were reciprocally violent. In other words, both parties mutual, engaged in mutual violence. Of those, um, and non-reciprocal, violent relationships. Seventy percent of the time the initiator was the woman. This never gets mentioned. Um, the courts don't acknowledge this. The police don't acknowledge this. And our basic premise is that domestic violence is indeed a problem. But if we're going to find the proper solution, we need to use real research okay. and not the myths and, and falsehoods that are being propagated by people like Lundy Bancroft. Okay, um, I'm told that we do have that that clip ready now. Now, um, this was uh, again. Uh, let me set this up for the viewers. This was um, a um, it was a fundraiser being held in Madison on uh, June 23rd, I believe, and um, some folks from Wisconsin Fathers were there to to protest. And, and um, we'll talk about, again, why they were protesting uh, after this uh, clip. So why don't we roll that? I, I sometimes can't believe this that a look like whole a countries, <laughs> whole judiciaries, <laughs> I think whole we've got the wrong one. What is this that we're judges? This is, can this is a lady by the name of Erin Pizzi. What now, is it? She... Why do they want to believe it when it's so patently and obviously untrue? I used yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. This is she was at uh, a conference that was just held recently in California on on uh, domestic violence and the the proper parameters that that should be seen. Um, she found that a large majority of the women who came to her shelters were violent themselves. Okay. And when she started to publish her findings, um, and stated this fact, um, she started receiving death threats and, and severe resistance from the, um, 
I don't want to denigrate feminists, but from the from the radical feminists who run most of the domestic violence shelters in the country. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, she went on a speaking tour in England and she had to have a police escort because, um, like I said, she received bomb threats and death threats and somebody killed her dog um, simply because she was trying to speak the truth mm -hmm. that, yes, women can be violent too. And, and I think, um, you know, we have had on in the past folks from our domestic abuse shelter, Christine Ann Center, here in town, and um, they, they know firsthand that women can sometimes perpetrate uh, domestic violence in, in the home, in the relationship. Um, so I don't know if we have this clip ready or not, uh, but um, on the off chance that it's, it's not ready, um, obviously you, you protested, again, not because you are pro-domestic violence, but because your organization feels that this Lundy Bancroft mm -hmm, um, right, right. is, you know, of the belief and continues to spread the message that women are like never the perpetrators in domestic abuse, domestic violence in, in the home, and that, of course, as we all know at this table, is, is not true. And um, so you were protesting that it's, he's painting things in a bad light for men. What we're I mean, trying to do, it, and what we wanted to do with this, with this demonstration was to start a dialogue and so that we can get the, the truth out. Mm -hmm. Because as I said before, we can't find a solution to this problem if we're not using the proper information. If we're operating under false pretenses, then we're not gonna come to a, to a, a correct solution mm -hmm. because we're not using the correct information. I, I will just say, um, because obviously we've got one side represented here, Shannon Berry, Executive Director of the Domestic Abuse Intervention Services, which is the group that, as you said, held the fundraiser, um, defended the keynote speaker, Lundy Bancroft, uh, saying that Bancroft refers to the U.S. Department of Justice statistics, which say that women are victims of domestic abuse 85% of the time. Barry adds that no one is saying that most men are batterers just because of those numbers, and the reality is that no one is demonizing men. So that's, that's her position on this. You wanted to start a dialogue with your demonstration. Did that happen? No. It did not? No. Um, actually, um, my senator, Senator Julie Lassa, her office has been for months now trying to set up a meeting with between Wisconsin Fathers and the Wisconsin Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and they simply refused to talk to us. Um, an aide by the name of Teresa, I believe, in Senator Lass's office has called numerous times, and she told me they simply ref refused to return her phone calls. So we're, like I said, we're, we're trying to, mm -hmm. you know, start this dialogue, but the funding that comes to the women's shelters primarily from under the auspices of the Violence Against Women Act, which in its, on its face is, seems to me to be discriminatory. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I can't speak for them because they won't talk to us, but it would seem to me, and I don't want to be too cynical here, but uh, they don't want it to jeopardize their funding. If they admit that women can be violent too, then perhaps their, their sources of funding will dry up. Mm -hmm. um, Harbor House, which is the, uh, in Appleton, mm -hmm. the, they have a budget of over a million dollars a year. Yet, they have no programs for men other than batterer treatment programs. And I know Ms. Berry said that she's, they're not claiming that all men are batterers. That may be true. But what they are claiming is that all batterers are men. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's the important thing, okay? That's what we're trying to, to talk about and trying to, to explain. Now, she mentions Department of Justice statistics. The problem with that is that comes, tends to come from arrest reports, mm -hmm. okay, police reports. Once the police get there, it's almost always the man who gets arrested, especially under their primary aggressor standards 
that most of the municipalities here in Wisconsin use. Mm -hmm. The police get there, nobody's fighting anymore, and unless the guy is laying there with a knife in his chest, um, they're going to arrest him. Mm -hmm. they, they, they arrest somebody, that diffuses the situation. Men are bigger, men are stronger. Um, so I suppose the, the theory is that that's the primary aggressor. But bottom line is we've arrested somebody, we don't have to come back tonight. Mm -hmm. And if you just use police reports, then yes, men are, are way overrepresented because usually they're the ones who get arrested. Even if they called and said, she's attacking me. Once the police get there, the man is likely to be arrested. Um, Jim has a, a, a personal situation whereby he called Domestic Abuse Intervention Services. And Jim, why don't you? Yeah. Well, it, it actually, um, I, had, uh, I had contacted Harbor House first and just to say, well, what, you know, what, what are my options here? Um, and they put me on hold and came back and said, we have a conflict and we can't help you. And I said, well, what should I do? They said, well, just call the police. And this was after, you know. And I'm like, all right. Well, I thought, well, let's keep, you know, where else could I go? Let, um, me, let me just interrupt right. for a second here, Jim. What was happening prior to that that led you to make that call? It, was, it wasn't at that moment. It was the okay. night before okay. uh, right. where I'd gotten attacked and hit and everything. And I'm okay. like, you know, I, you know, I've got no permanent, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking this is obviously not right. What are my, what tools are at my disposal to help me, help my family, okay. even gotcha. help my wife at the time? Um, and because uh, obviously it's not a, a good solution to conflict. Right. Um, and it was, you know, we have a conflict, we can't help you, call the police. I'm like, well, I don't really want to do that because I didn't want to get, I didn't want to go that far. And, um, and then, well, so I thought, well, what's my next, you know, my next option, which was, I thought, well, go to a, a larger city, um, one that might have more of a, uh, you know, more diverse a, a view of things. Um, my fiance at the time, was actually a, uh, a volunteer for domestic abuse intervention. And she said, call them. And, and I thought, oh, I'm sure with everything from same-sex couples and everything, I thought Madison would definitely have something for me. And again, I'm looking for some sliver of some recommendation of, I, I don't expect to be you know, given the same amount of welcome as, as a you know, truly you know, damaged and battered woman, but I thought they'd have some tools for me. A needle in a haystack would yeah. be helpful, um, right? And, um, and so when I called and I said, you know, my wife is, has hit me and has threatened to kill me, my ex-wife. And, and the woman on the phone was very nice and she goes, oh, you've, you've, you've hit your wife and threatened to kill her? I s and I said, no, <laughs> she, she has hit me. Well, you hit your wife. And, and it's just, it, she could not, I mean, literally, she was very nice about it, but she, it's like she couldn't, she didn't hear me, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, because she couldn't imagine that a man was saying, and I said, well, thank you very much, and I hung up and I ended up, um, ended up having to, uh, I, I kept doing research, and all I wanted to do was just say, A, am I a victim of violence? What, you know, what should I do? What's, you know, do you have any recommendations for me to better manage the situation? I had to go all the way to Illinois for a, mm. a group that's in northern Illinois called Safe for All, um, mm -hmm. and, it's, um, and it's also domestic violence, but it's, it's a gender neutral, um, and they, I didn't realize this that at the time, but they put me through about a two-hour assessment, which I found out at the end was to determine whether I was the primary aggressor mm. or not because they wanted to say, you know, they didn't want to have someone come down there. And it, and it was just a series of, you know, psychological questions, right. interview questions. And um, at the end, and I had, to, you know, I had pictures that my daughters had drawn and everything. And, um, and then they, they said, you know, we're very concerned because so we think you're in danger. Um, and, and that was, you know, so they gave me some advice on safety and that type of thing. Sure. Um, and Ashley had written a, a letter to the guardian ad litem, which was ignored. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, so all, you know, all is well. I'm I'm here. I'm, but I remember at Safe for All, they had a list of um, of names of people who were uh, who were killed in domestic violence mm -hmm. instances. And now again, many many women's names. But the, she pointed out, she said, there's you know, like 15 men in here mm -hmm. that have you know died at the hands of their aggressor who was female. Um, now there might have been a hundred women. Sure. However, there's still 15 men that have died. Yeah. And, uh, and she said, we take this very seriously. And her concern was that if, if the message is, you know, you men stop beating your wives, and in the meantime, the women don't get any message at all, in fact, are almost encouraged to because it can be a very serious point of leverage to make a false accusation. Um, you know, the, the problem is not, 
male violence or female violence. The problem is violence in and of itself. Sure. Um, and what I would, I think the darkest day would be is let's say for instance they solve the problem and in boys and getting the message you don't hit girls, you don't hit, you don't hit, and no one's telling that to girls. Violence but with it, you know, violence committed by girls is skyrocketing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's yeah. it's women against it's girls against girls. It's you know, yeah, it's Steve it's Steve McNair, the quarterback right. for the Tennessee Titans, right? Now, yeah. Classic nothing. example, right, right. there. Um, we've got um, we've got uh, some graphics up here um, that uh, a single sheet of information. Now, what is it that we're seeing here? Well, this is okay. these are perpetrator relationships for fatal child abuse, okay? One of the problems we have, because um, one of, one of our, our main goals is to pass legislation to, to equalize parenting, and the objection comes from the um, domestic violence vi victim advocates who say that men are dangerous and we don't want to put children in dangerous situations. Again, the reality shows, as this chart demonstrates, that mothers are twice as likely to kill their children as fathers are, mm -hmm. and this never is heard. Um, one of the things that Jim mentioned, um, where his, his wife hit him. Now, two-thirds of injuries suffered um, in domestic violence injuries are, are by women. Okay, so, and putting aside the one-third of domestic violence injuries that are suffered by men, um, a researcher by the name of Deborah Capaldi, who is a PhD and a social scientist at the Oregon Social Learning Center, um, finds that the best way for women to be safe is to not initiate violence against their partner. In other words, she hits him and he hits her back. She ends up, because men are bigger and stronger, um, she ends up injured. That goes into the statistics. Well, look at this. And the question that's never asked is, well, who started this? I was a cab driver when I lived in Winona, Minnesota. And I drove a young lady who uh, volunteered at the local women's shelter there. And she told me that she finally had to quit because she was disillusioned with the, with the way that they were counseling their, their clients. Um, for example, they would say, well, here, we, we're going to take you down to court. And we're going to fill out the forms for a restraining order. Mention that he hit you, but don't mention that you poured a cup of boiling water on his head first. And she says, that's just not right, um, which I agree with. You know, the bottom line is violence is wrong. Mm -hmm. But in our society, violence by women against men is not viewed as a serious concern. It's viewed as humorous, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, a good example in uh, the movie Sex in the City, mm -hmm. okay, um, the star, I can't think of her name. Je Sarah Jessica Parker. Thank you. Okay. They were coming out of a nightclub or a bar. And there's a couple arguing on the street outside. And apparently this guy has just divulged to his girlfriend that he's really married. Okay. Now this guy may be a heel and he may be a jerk, but she says, you're married? And she slaps him. Not only that, she takes her handbag and she starts pounding on his head. Now. Everybody in the audience is chuckling and laughing and ha, ha, ha. And I'm thinking to myself, isn't this assault? And is there not no excuse for abuse? Right. Which is the mantra from the women's groups. But that only applies to men. Right. I saw I, earlier, um, I checked out the website for Harbor House in, in Appleton. And they claim that they serve a diverse population. And Hmongs and Hispanics and but one segment of the population that they have no services at all for is men. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're part of the population. All right. Yet, when Jim called, they couldn't help. Um, when he went to Dias, or DAIS in, in Madison, they couldn't get their minds around the idea that a woman was committing domestic violence or threatening to commit domestic violence. And that's the problem that we want to start this dialogue about. Sure. To say, look, you know, not only is our tax money supporting this one-sided argument, but we're never going to find a solution until we admit what the problem really is sure. and stay away from the politically correct aspect that men are batterers, women are victims. 
Well, and, and the overall message, nobody should put a hand on anybody else. Right. <laughs> ever yes. right. and um, not only that but you know domestic abuse and and so forth is is more than just touching too it, you know it gets into um, emotional abuse verbal abuse yep that can be yep that and th that if we could get into that that's another yep. subject for a whole nother show um, but real quickly in the remaining minutes that we have um, what what is your relationship with or what is your experience with other domestic abuse shelters. Um, you said Harbor House doesn't have anything for men. What is they have, they have They have batterer treatment programs that they can refer you to. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's assuming that you're the batterer, that the man is the batterer. That's what they all assume. Right. It's, well, but I mean, in, in talking with our folks here in this county, uh, in this city, we know that they have had um, experience with men who have been victims of domestic abuse. And do they have programs um, for that? That I don't know, but you know we that do have them question. on from time to time, and, and that will be something that we ask. But but so your feeling then, your contention is that there are none in Wisconsin that offer programs for men who are the victims as opposed to there was there was a, a, a survey done on men who had called for help. This was in California. Mm -hmm. Um, Seventy percent of the men who responded said that they got little to no help from the um, domestic violence shelters that they had called. Some of them said that the people laughed at them. What's the matter with you? What kind of a wimp are you? And hung up the phone. Steve, wouldn't it make sense if, if the statistics say even the Justice Department, 85 percent of, you know, it's 85 percent victims are women, that would mean 15 percent mm -hmm. are men. Wouldn't logic dictate that maybe 15% or 5% or 2% of that million dollar budget was going to, you know, to say at least an equal proportion, even, even if you say those are valid? I, don't, I, I would think this probably... Well, I, again, using that 85% figure is, is misleading because right. we're talking about police reports. Mm -hmm. um, actually, and in some counties, for example, in Dane County, um, last year there was, I believe, and rough off the top of my head, there were roughly 500 women or 500 men arrested for domestic violence and probably 350 women. Okay, so some counties do have, or at least see what the problem really is. But the resources that are available for the victims um, are horribly slanted towards women victims and men victims are either ignored or denied altogether. Mm -hmm. And again, I keep coming back to this. We can't solve this problem, okay, if we don't have the right facts and figures. Mm -hmm. And to expand just a little bit on what you were saying, most altercations in families are minor and really don't deserve police intervention. Um, the Department of Justice statistics, which show that um, 4.2 per thousand females aged 12 and older were victims of non-fatal domestic violence between 2001 and 2005. 4.2. Now, the women's advocates will tell you that one in three women are victims of domestic violence, but this is and this, these are from Department of Justice fig figures. Right. Okay, right. it's not nearly as prevalent as they claim. Again, my cynicism is showing here, but uh, if, it's not, if it's not that big of a problem, then they don't need these millions and millions of dollars. Right. All right, very good. Well, we're going to have to leave it there as we're out of time, but thanks to all three of you for, for being thanks here. Thanks for tonight. having us. Um, and um, I, I Ha I hope we've been putting this up throughout the, uh, throughout the half hour, but uh, the website uh, is wisconsinfathers.org, wisconsinfathers.org, and the phone number is 608-ALL-DADS, 608-ALL-DADS. So uh, thanks very much again for Thank being you. here. We'll, Thank uh, you. We'll yes, look forward to you. have you guys on again, and, uh, and we're going to let you go put your other hat on now. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will be joined by Dick Spanbauer, Assemblyman from the 53rd Assembly District. We'll be right back.
or someone you know is a father who's been shut out of a child's life by a custody system that unfairly favors mothers, there is somewhere you can turn for help. Wisconsin Fathers for Children and Families is a group of fathers, grandparents, second wives, and others who understand how unfair the system can be and the pain that it causes. Kids need the love and support of both their parents. Help us to help you. Contact us now. I love my mommy and my daddy. Why can't I be with both of them? If you believe that parents should be treated equally in divorce, call 1-800-362-9472 and tell them you support the Equal Placement Bill. Again, that's 1-800-362-9472. Well, I finally have some time off, so I'm writing to tell you that I'm doing well. We have good days and bad days over here. We try to remember the good ones and get through the bad ones. Mostly we have each other, and that's what keeps us going. And Mom, since you asked, if anyone wants to help, just tell them to contact the USO. You can't believe how much they do for us. With love, your son, Michael. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security payments, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. And welcome back to Ayan Oshkosh. So we're joined now by uh, Dick Spanbauer, 53rd Assembly Districtman, um, serving uh, just a little bit of Oshkosh and a whole bunch of townships and, yeah, and yeah. villages. Uh, well, I've got north of uh, pretty much uh, what's north of Murdoch. Goes into the town of Oshkosh, and then uh, I've got most of the towns in Winnebago County, Fond du Lac County, and all of Waupun in okay. Dodge County. All so right. it's it's t about 21 municipalities and uh, it's, it's a huge district it, it, it is. Really is and I always told Gordy Hens I said I envy you all you got <laughs> is the city of Oshkosh <laughs> you know it, it, it's it's probably three or four times the cost when you campaign yeah it's a full-time job if you got competition I mean you know and I when I campaign I campaign and I hit every municipality yeah uh, so the gas I that cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars just for gas uh, mm -hmm. from where I go in that. It's huge, but guess what? You know, since I've been elected, uh, the one thing I enjoy always is meeting people. People are very interesting. And I've started doing office hours, which means that I'll uh, designate a time on a certain day in advance of like the village of Oakfield I've done and this, this city of uh, Oshkosh. I did at the Senior Center, Waupon, different areas like that. And what I like about it is when people say, you know, you're the first time that somebody's come down here and, and, has, and that's, it, it's such a satisfaction to hear that. Sure. You know, it makes you feel like, hey, you, you, you're representing the people, they're happy, I'm happy. Even if they complain, because you never get a 100% a of right. a good thing going all the time. I mean, there's people uh, that will complain. I've gotten a lot of complaints, of course, on the budget. Uh, they pretty much know where I stood on it right. and some issues, and there was maybe a couple items I disagreed on my party's side. And sure. That's one thing I do is I try, try to be open-minded right. and not so much to the right. Well, and we're going to talk about all of that. Um, but, okay. but this is the first time you've been on the show, Dick, since since, since you got elected. elected. Yeah. So My, what? Oh, what time uh, flies. But but you know you're always such a fun guest, and you know uh, Dan's not here tonight, of course, but he and I are. I, I think we share a lot of political views, um, very similarly. Um, I know the last time you were on, we had some differences, Dan and I. Yeah. Uh, 
against you, really, <laughs> or you well, against us. I, right? I don't have a problem. But you know, the nice thing is, is that when you come on, we can, you know, and you and I have always been this way. We can disagree politically. Yeah, I hit it off and, with you on that. That's and, not yeah, a problem. And we walk away from the table <laughs> and, you know, we shake hands and yep. we have a great yep. conversation and we talk about all kinds of other stuff, in, in, including more politics. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's the way it's, you present yourself and the way you ask questions and, um, you know, that, you know, I, I'm very perspect uh, perceptive, I should say. And, you know, you can tell if somebody's just trying to just trying to get the goods on you or this or that or whatever, or if they're really asking the questions because they really want to know how you feel about it. And even if they disagree, that they w can disagree. And it's not going to be snotty or nasty or something, some stupid remark or whatever. So you and I have always hit it off yep. that way. My, I've told my wife that and other people, and they've asked me, how do you like being on Cheryl Hens' show? I like Cheryl Hens. I do. Well, and, you, and, and I, I like, like your you, program. So. I like your program. I'm not buttering... Uh, yep, for any particular reason, or tickling <laughs> your ears to get more air time or something like that. But you always have an interesting show, and, and there's times when I've taped it, and if I can, you know, watch it or whatever, um, I do yeah. because you do have some interesting things. Well, thank you for for those nice words. Um, I didn't pay Dick to say them either. Well, I was looking um, for a <laughs> gift certificate for uh, Robbins or something like that. I thought maybe uh, uh, or a donation to my campaign. Well, no, 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 that wouldn't be too good, would it? Uh, <laughs> We'd both be getting in trouble over something like that. Probably. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, but you've been in office now for about six or seven months. Um, you know, what's your general impression of? Is it everything that you thought it would be, or it's, it's, were there it's, some surprises? It's, no, there was no real surprises. Uh, the the only little, if you want to call it a surprise. First of all, politics is politics. I don't care if you got it on a local level. You got it in Madison. Believe yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing is, you can get almost into a real debate or, or I hate to say, argument or whatever with somebody on the opposite. Spirited discussion. Spirit, I like that, discussion. And no matter how maybe worked up you can get, when it's all over with, it's, hey, how you doing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening? You got a picnic going? Oh, yeah, it's casual talk. It's like business as usual. It's like it's not... Uh, meant to, to sound or be like a personal thing all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I hate that guy because he's a Republican or he's a Democrat. It's not like that. Yeah. Lawyers are like that too, you know. <laughs> uh, I've covered so many court cases in, in my career and, you know, they can, these attorneys on opposite sides of, of the aisle can be going at it, hammer yep. and tong, yep. but, uh, you know, when court is adjourned for the day, it, yeah. they're heading out to dinner or yep. heading out to lunch, lunch or the golf or course like, or whatever yep. the case may be. And so. that, you know, and I, I like that spirit of uh, the way uh, people can interact with one another mm -hmm. with differences. Yeah. But yet, of my 30 plus years uh, being involved, and of course I swung the gavel for the last time in April of this year, I didn't run for re-election. Um, I've seen in a lot- In the town. Of, uh, in the yeah. town, I'm sorry. Uh, in the town. And uh, I've, I've done that for a long time. And But you know, people, sometimes unfortunately you can disagree and there's people, for the most part, I've had good experiences. You can disagree with somebody and agree to disagree, but then there's some that take it so personal that it's like uh, they're out for blood. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, I've experienced that. And sometimes, uh, and all too uh, often, it tends to divide, and uh, it also has an effect uh, on the town, is the people and, yeah. and that. So uh, while I've never uh, felt that I've done, you know, 100% a great job, I've always felt that I've done it to the best of my ability. Um, you know, and I've, where I've made errors, I've tried to apologize for that or make, make it better. But you know, the whole key behind it is even if you're wrong um, and, and there's something you've said or you've done that's wrong, uh, it's the ability to say, I'm wrong. I did something wrong, I apologize for it, let's try something different and go on. But mean it. Yeah. You know, you can say, say things, lip service, but you have to mean it. Mm -hmm. And I, I can honestly say that I've always tried to be upfront with people, uh, even if it hurts yep. you know, at my board meetings, because politi politicians traditionally, 
they like to sometimes get in a situation where they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They're mm -hmm. always trying to appease both sides. You can't do it. Right. I learned that a long time ago. You well, can't do that. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you said it earlier, and I, I've known you a lot of years, Dick, and, and you've always said this. I mean, your opinion on this has never swayed. Um, you are a registered Republican. Yeah. Uh, you ran as a Republican, uh, but you do not always feel necessary to vote the straight party line no matter what the issue is. You are your own man, really. Yeah, I did. Uh, one thing I, d I was against uh, in the legislature uh, with the budget is I could not vote on the amendment that limits the cap levy to 2%, and that's a big thing. And the other Republicans in the caucus had told me, they said, well, that keeps taxes down, Dick, you know, whatever. I says, I don't like the idea of a legislator in Janesville or Rock County or wherever telling my town what's good for my town. We're elected to handle a budget, and right or wrong, the local populace is the one that votes us in or votes us out. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a stranglehold, and it is a stranglehold because of what's happening with the costs. Uh, as you know, uh, the gas has gone up over the years, especially we had that $4. Well, that means that your petroleum products, when you're paving or seal coating, is sky high. Mm -hmm. What that means is you would work, try to work with a budget and try to keep the taxes down as little as possible. But what's happening is, because of the cap levy, the costs keep going up, but you've got to keep staying under a 2% yeah. levy. And they said, they said to me in the legislature, well, all you have to do is go to a referendum. Oh, yeah, how many people are going to vote for an increase in taxes? I mean, if we're doing, and we're doing it for the right reason, we want to maintain our roads, the drainage, you know, different things like that. So I, that was one big thing I disagree with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most of them were like, you know what's, what's interesting, Cheryl, i got to tell you, is I find, and this is on both sides, because I talk to the other Democrats and I get along with a bunch of Democrats on that side as well, is that it's a party deal, and they hate to go against the party. They're afraid that if I go against the party, okay, this bill that's coming up that I've got, you know, they're going to shoot me down on it. That's the most popular thing I hear down there. And I think the way to break that, or at least I'll, I'll try, um, without creating a big wave or being a radical down there, is, is to be honest, if you disagree in a caucus, say it, and I'm finding out little by little, I won't mention names, are starting to come out of the woodwork and say, yeah, Dick, you know, after the caucus is over, uh, you know, Dick, I agree with you on that or whatever. And I said, well, why don't you say that in there? And because here's what I found. When I campaign, uh, this is my third time I campaigned for this office. You know, I campaign against Carol. Yep, Carol Owens. People are telling me, Dick, you know something? We traditionally would vote straight Republican. We're not doing that anymore. We look at the candidate, we look at the issues, and we vote on those values. I am finding that in every municipality I go to. And it reminds me of when uh, Palin and McCain ran. Their theme was the same way. It's country first, or people first, or, or country first. How did I want to say that? People first. <laughs> I don't people know. first, party second. That's what I wanted to say. Because that was on my literature. Yeah. It's people well, first, party second. And that's how it should be. And that's it, why I'd like to yeah. see the parties just done away with. And as I think a lot of people in this country would. But that's not ever going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. But I can't. I don't know if I could support it going away because I think it, if anything, it makes it easier for people to look at the issues a little bit more and what the differences are. Um, I don't know if I can explain that to you. If you get an independent, then uh, that's fine and dandy, but how do you know what he really stands for? I mean, when there's party platforms is what I want to say. But you know what, Dick? So many times, I know what you're saying, but so many times a, a politician, as you said, flaps their gums, and you still don't know what they stand for well, because they do something completely opposite of what they're saying. And some of them are pretty good at that. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're, they're slippery. <laughs> they they're can slippery. say something for 15 <laughs> minutes, and somebody will, will say to me, I remember last year I was at, a, I won't say what it was and who it was or whatever, and you hit your head like, what did he say? Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned know. the caucuses. Um, you know, one of the things I think that frustrates a lot of people about the caucuses is is they're held secretly, you know, they're held behind closed doors. We don't get to see what's going on. And it, it's almost like a, a contradiction in terms, sort of, because, you know, Wisconsin historically has been um, very progressive in advocating mm -hmm. for open government 
and sunshine laws and all that kind of thing. And they've been equally aggressive in pursuing those mm -hmm. who break those laws. Uh, sometimes it may just be a slap on the wrist, but they aggressively investigate and, and you know, it may take a long time too, but they go after oh, sure. and they, they look into these things. And yet, the very body that puts those books, those laws on the books, is one of the same bodies that's meeting behind closed doors and caucuses out of the eye of the tax paying public. Would you ever support the caucuses being held in open? Uh, that's, been, that's been asked, it's always being asked. And the only thing I can honestly answer you on is I don't think I would be completely uh, for closing caucuses. There are times when I've been in a caucus when we had to close it because of strategy, mm -hmm. floor strategy, different things, how we're gonna uh, present ourselves with this bill. It's like, a, it's strategy. It's like mm -hmm. uh, being in a huddle in a football uh, a game, you sure. know? It's strategy, oh, so-and-so came in now. They took him out, okay, let's go to this play. You don't go tell the other team what you're gonna do, you know? But you, you, you operate in secrecy in a huddle and then you present a plan and then you go about it. And I see that the same way in the caucus. I'm afraid that it's gotten carried away with the fact of that we're always in secret, like conspiring to do something uh, that's not right. Um, I think that, I have to say it, I think the Democrats have done that in the budget where they barred our people uh, from coming in that are members of the Joint Finance Committee, made their decisions, then called the four Republicans in. Uh, but guess what? I think the Republicans probably are just as guilty as in past sessions that they've had, you know. So it's both sides for that matter. But I think uh, there's a reason for caucuses and why you close the doors and you have somebody stand outside and there's signs posted. Uh, caucus is closed. That means we're, there's something that we're, we're not conspiring. We're just maybe a lot of times uh, talking about strategy. Um, if there's just issues that we're debating or something that we're just tossing around about some new bills or new things, I maybe don't see a problem with that. You know, if, if uh, the press came in, a reporter sat down. I'm trying to differentiate from the fact of just completely closing caucuses. Sure. But I think it's gotten out of hand with the public thinking that every caucus we have that's, you know, is, is secret and we're doing something illegal and we're hiding it. That's not sim that's simply well, not true. I don't know that the public thinks that there's something illegal going on. I, I that's just the think way that, they approach me. Yeah, I, I just think that they feel like, you know, um, you're doing the people's business um, with the people's money mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, why can't the people see what's going on? And I happen to subscribe to that, to that very same premise. Now, Granted, you know, you were on a town board for a lot of years, yeah. you know, we've got the city council here in the city of Oshkosh, and th all their meetings, years two, were open to the public, yep. but from time to time, because of we need strategy or yep. personnel issues, you'd have to go into a closed session, executive session, uh, you know, and, and, generally and, and there's a reason for that. That was the reason for it. Usually it was a legal thing, or personnel, or something like that, you just can't it's not an open book to the public. There's some things that are very sensitive and you can't discuss in open. In fact, actually, it's a violation. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's some things. It's like I was hounded uh, in uh, Algoma. What's going on with Algoma? Well, I knew there were certain things, but I couldn't, I couldn't open my mouth to anybody yeah. because we had a session that uh, had to stay quiet. Sure. So partially open, partially closed, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I could not so. uh, a vote for a completely closed all the time caucus. Okay, uh, good. There is reasons for it. Um, I, I want to get to, before we run out of time here, and, and we're already down to like four and a half minutes, um, Ignition Interlock Devices. Um, you are one of the co-sponsors of this. Yeah. And this is, um, this is something that it would require Ignition Interlock Devices for one year on the vehicle of any first-time offender first time. who had a blood alcohol level of 0.15 or, yeah. or higher. Or higher. Um, and, th that, and that's basically, th that's almost twice the legal limit because the legal limit is 0.08. Eight. Yeah. So this would be first-time offenders with a BAC of 0.15 right. or um, also mandatory for repeat offenders. Um, what's your premise for wanting to do this real no, quickly? No, I mean, at first, at first, at f f um, I, I've been presented with drunk driving bills for the last seven months. And I've always felt offhand, and it may sound kind of negative to the MAD group, 
that the first offense that can happen, um, not going lightly to a point where you just slap them on the wrist, some people think you do, but then I started thinking, and with this here, uh, that maybe it's, maybe you should uh, hit them harder the first time. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people need that extra you know, the inner uh, lock ignition, mm -hmm. which I don't know if that's totally foolproof either. Well, it's not. We had uh, the county district attorney on uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, he was saying that... Um, oh, Chris, yeah. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Christian, yeah. He was saying that, you know, people can, you know, they'll use someone else's car, uh, they'll, they'll get <laughs> someone else to blow into the machine. Um, so since you've kind of co-sponsored this, um, ha have your views on it changed a little bit or? No, no, because I think you have to apply uh, what you have at hand. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I think that's, that's missing and one thing I've talked to other, uh, even Democrats that have had these bills besides Republicans, is you need also to interject besides the criminal offense uh, of time in jail, prison, depending on what the circumstance is, uh, but you need them therapy classes, them alcohol classes. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people, they don't, uh, I've talked to a lot of drunk driving people that went through this and all that stuff, and they go through it as a formality. But I think that's something that needs to be stepped up. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an exhaustive, I'll call it that way, for some people, a, a program, I think that social services, I think, I, I'm not sure which agency does that, but they have something like a 14 or 16 week course. And it is detailed. And I think we have to get more involved besides the penalties, which I'm all for, with education. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, I've had drunk drivers tell me, and I've talked to a lot of them purposely, you know, or people that were convicted of it. Mm -hmm. And what, what was your feeling, I'd ask them. Well, look, I don't want to drink like that. I've had more than one person tell me, I don't want to drink. These are people with fourth and up. Yeah fourth, fifth, sixth. I don't want to drink. It's just a compulsion. I see a, a beer sign and I get triggered. Or <laughs> if I have a beer, yes. And I talked to even uh, two uh, doctors, uh, people with master's degrees, and they said that there is something in the brain, a chemical imbalance, if you will, sure. that triggers that. And I don't know how you correct that. I also am interested in a pill that's been around for a while that if they take this pill, they cannot have any alcohol. If they do, they have a very serious reaction. Doesn't kill them. Well, but, yeah, I would hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't stay. Well, wouldn't they might stay take. Yeah, I know. I know. They, but that. no, and they have done this. They have given this pill to some people that are really uh, into their sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or whatever it is. Um, but the problem is, is that it's we're killing people on the roads. Exactly. So, I mean, um, that's, that's the long and the short of it, and something has to be done about it. Um, so we might see some companion legislation yeah. with this at some point down the road. But there has to be an emphasis stronger on therapy, if you want to use that term. Treatment programs. Treatment and, programs and besides you. the fact of punishing. Okay. All right. Because I, uh, I don't excuse the crime. I mean, they've, if they get a penalty of a year in jail, fine. But along with that, you know they're going to get out. So right. you've got to have some type of uh, right. uh, treatment. Okay. You know, for that matter. But I enjoy what I'm doing. Well, good. And I mean. we enjoy having you on. <laughs> and unfortunately, we're out of time. Oh, <laughs> where did that go? Was this 15 minutes or 30 minutes? I, I think it was a little less than a half an hour, I think. Um, <laughs> well, I But we were waiting that. for you to get here. And I know I'm you've sorry. got a, another place to yeah, go tonight. I do. So anyway, but thank you. And we will have you back again. Okay. And hopefully not, Pleasure. Uh, hopefully not uh, too Pleasure. far down the road. So <laughs> uh, just sit tight. And uh, thanks uh, to all of our guests on this particular edition and to the crew. And as always, to you at home. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.